Hi there Booktube. So I'm recording this in uh, late September but by the time it's uploaded the Booktube prize finals results will have been announced and um, this year was the first year that there was a, a section for translated fiction and that's what I've been involved in judging and I've judged three out of those four rounds which has involved me in reading 14 books because obviously some books you read in earlier rounds can survive and, and turn up in later ones. Now, if you watch this channel, you know I read books in translation, you know, that's one of my um, interests and enthusiasms. It, but nevertheless, reading for the Booktube Prize introduced me to authors and to books that I didn't otherwise know and might never otherwise have discovered. So. Um, a huge thank you to Robert who organises this, this wonderful and most democratic of, of um, book prizes. And if you are active um, on social media around books and reading, if you've got a booktube channel or you're a regular you know, booktube commentator, you too can be part of the booktube prize in next year. So you just have to sign up around Christmas and um, I'll put the link below to the um, booktube prize website. Now, I'm going to do my rankings. I'm going to go from six to one. All, all four of these books are books that I've talked about in, 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 in previous videos because, um, you know, they were ones I read for previous rounds. But I'm not going to assume that um, you've, you've watched those. I'm going to do like a little, a little mini review for all six because I, these are all, as you'd expect by the final, good books that might be books that you will want to read equally. I think some of them are books that won't appeal to everybody. So, you know, watch and see if any of them would be, might be a book for you. Okay, now, number six is one of the books that was new to me for this round. And it's The Phone Box or American Edition Phone Booth um, at the Edge of the World by Laura M. I. Messina, translated by um, Lucy Brand from the Italian. Now, um, uh, Messina it is Italian, but she's married to someone Japanese and has been living in Japan for the last 15 years. And this book is set in Japan. And I think there is something um, intrinsically quite interesting about someone writing about a country where that they've moved to and that they've lived in long enough to get to know well, but they're not a native of that country. So so they, they they're looking at it with different eyes, fresh eyes. I, I think, yeah, that's strength of the book for me. But this is very definitely at number six from my point of view. Why? Why? <sighs> Essentially, this is a really nice book. And really nice books aren't really Rose's cup of tea. I think, um, you know, but you may like really nice books, so I'm going to try and sort of do it justice and it give you a flavour of it. Okay, so the, the, the phone box in the title is based on a real phone box that is set in a garden in um, a sort of coastal town in northeast Japan. And it was set up there sometime after the, the dreadful um, loss of life and damage in the um, tsunami in, I think it was 2000, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 2000 and, oh well, doesn't matter, does it? Um, and this phone box is not connected to any kind of telecommunication system. It is, it is what's described as a wind phone, um, a phone that people can come to and use to talk to people that they have lost, um, lost because they're dead or perhaps in some other way become separated and estranged from. So a lovely idea and, you know, it's a real thing and, and you know, but the book is, is a sort of fictionalised um, uh, imagining about some people that choose to use the wind phone to deal with um, their sort of losses and, and bereavements. And there are two main characters who who meet accidentally on when they're both on their first visit to the garden and they become friends and keep visiting and we, we follow them and their developing sort of friendship and but there are other characters as well and you know it's it's 
heartwarming and gentle and thoughtful. It's written kind of in short episodes and in between those episodes you get um, little mini chapters that are almost like prose poems, you know, like lists of, of the sweets that, that one of the characters bought the other one's daughter in a shop or, you know, it, yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely. It is. Yeah, it is intrinsically, definitely lovely. It's just that, I don't know, I kind of react against that sort of heartwarming thing, maybe. If you don't, do read this book. You know, it's, 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 it's beautifully written. And, um, I, um, yeah, just because it's not me doesn't mean that lots of people won't love it. I'll be sorry if it wins, though. So, number five is definitely a good book. It's a, it's a big book with lots of richness and depth and, and really fascinating kind of content. Um, the book is The Art of Losing by Alice Zenita, um, translated from the French by Frank Wynne. Zenita is French and of sort of Algerian heritage. Um, and this book it draws on that. So she 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 follows three generations of the family, and there's a slight hint that it, you know there may be an element of, of her own family in this, but it's not, you know, that's not sort of made explicit. And you know, we start with the grandfather growing up in rural Algeria, um, making some tough choices to sort of try and support his family and and make a, a you know make his way in 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 life in this little village in the in in, in the in the mountains um decisions that mean he's caught up in the algerian war of independence kind of on the the wrong side on the french side yeah um then we have the son who is born in Algeria but is uprooted um, and taken to France because you know the family have to, to, to flee the country after um, the revolution is successful and he has to cope with the experience of being you know an immigrant and and that thing of being the 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 younger generation who learns um, things faster and then has to as a child is sort of supporting adult relatives with their sort of French bureaucracy and so on because you know that you know really interesting set of experiences both of those okay it's so the third character that I found less satisfying I suppose and that's Neymar who's the sort of the third generation present day sort of um character and she she works in an art gallery in Paris you know so she's sort of very you know she's she's um you know uh, identifies very much as French rather than Algerian um and but she comes to be kind of pushed to revisit revisit Algeria and revisit her family's history so why is it at number five? Because I, I think I've sounded quite enthusiastic up to now. I think, like, Zenita wanted to do a lot in this book. And she almost tried to pack too much in. You know, rightly, she wants us to look at colonisation. She wants us to look at the kind of complexity of a civil war um, or, or, or war of independence, but where, you know, there's a lot of different groups involved and... and um, She's looking at racism and at the migrant experience and how France treated um, those Algerians who, um, you know, only came to France because they kind of were associated with the French side and yet they were kind of really shut upon, you know, in, in, in France in many ways. Um, she's also talking about memory and about family history and about things that get told and don't told and, you know, all of that, all of that. And... I mean, if you love a longer, slower, almost sort of epic kind of family saga -y sort of book, then you will really appreciate this. For myself, I think it could have been a bit shorter and more focused um, and it would have worked better for me. Number four. Number four has been the most troubling and confusing of the books that I have read for this prize. And um, I read it in the first round. 
and I reread it for this round to be sure well, to try and work out what I thought about it and be try and make sure I was being being fair to it, you know, fix a view of it. And that's Disquad by Zulfu Livanelli, translated from the Turkish by Brendan Freely. Now, Livanelli is a Turkish musician, writer, um, journalist, political activist, you know, really interesting man. Um, and his really strong kind of social and political values and his commitment to, to human rights um, you know, really shine through in this novel. Um, it's the story of a journalist, Ibrahim, who's from the southeast of Turkey, what he describes as Mesopotamian Turkey, you know, like the, you know, yes, the, where Turkey kind of is close to like Syria and Iraq and Iran. And, yeah. um, and he returns there to look into the death of a, a childhood friend who's been stabbed in Germany, but was in Germany having fled after being shot in their hometown of Mardin um, in, in, say, southeast Turkey. And he discovers that Hussein had fallen in love with um, a refugee from Syria called Melek Naz. And um, Melek Naz is um, Yazidi. Now, um, the Yazidis, if you don't know, you probably do, are... Um, they're a sort of a minority group in, in that part of the world that have, um, uh, uh, it's like it belong to an ancient religion that is kind of out of step with the, the big monotheistic um, religions like Judaism, Christianity and Islam that, you know, dominate in that area and are uh, hang on to that and are kind of persecuted as a result. And... Um, this character Malik Nas um, has, as as Yazidi genuinely have been, um, uh, been sort of had to flee Syria after the most appalling treatment by ISIS um, in the yeah during the Syrian Syrian conflict, and then she continues to face prejudice and hatred in Turkey, um, and is you know rejected by. Um, uh, Hussein's family um, because you know Yazidis are seen in, by traditional Muslims as as like more or less Satan worshippers. Ibrahim also becomes obsessed with Melek Naz. Um, he almost sort of inherits that you know obsession that um, that Hussein had and is sort of pursuing her. <sighs> But she remains something of an enigma. Now, I think that may have been, you know, a deliberate choice by um, Livanelli in, in the way he's written this book. You know, in a way, he's wanting to show how powerless she is. Um, he doesn't give her a voice because he he he's sort of almost demonstrated how he's demonstrating in how he writes a book how objectified she is. And I think he may have been avoiding trying as a male writer to sort of write in, in the voice of a, a woman that's been raped and enslaved, you know, and that may have been good choices. But somehow I was left with a book that was very much through the, the male gaze in a way that that just sort of left me uncomfortable and, and, and made me perhaps unable to judge it impartially. I'm really, really interested in other people's opinions about, about this book, I have to say. So, let's move on to my top three. Number three is a short book that, nevertheless, really surprised and satisfied me. Uh, it's How to Order the Universe by Maria Jose Ferrada, and it was translated by Elizabeth Breyer from the Spanish. And the magic of this book, I'd say, is the way it, it works on two levels. So, on the surface, we have M, who is a seven-year-old um, at the start of the, of the book, who skips school to go off with her father, who's a salesman of, of hardware goods. And, you know, she becomes like expert on the, the hardware catalogue and interprets the world in terms of, you know, blurbs for hardware tool, tools. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 she, she sort of helps him in his sales as a salesman. It's, 
a really convincing picture of a child, I think, and of a slightly uneasy father-daughter relationship and, you know, another family. Um, I, I think that writing from a child's perspective very often fails in books for adults and it often turns out to be a bit sort of I don't know, twee or cutesy or or, or, or or just, I don't know, naff really. And this absolutely isn't, you know, the child's perspective works. But at the same time, the other layer that's there for us is we, we're in, 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 unspoken, but we're in Chile under Pinochet, okay. And there, there's a sense, an overriding sense of tension in the background of the book and we gradually read between the lines to see the other the other story that is going on who is this photographer what are the ghosts that he's seeking you know and then at a certain point things come to a head and then we get the the aftermath of that um i'm trying to avoid sort of too many spoilers here so so i mean it's a book it, it's that although it was short it it it's it's it was big in my head and has stuck in my mind. Number two. Number two was the other of the two books that were new for me this round. And that was Brickmakers by Selva Almada, a translator from Spanish by Annie McDermott. And this is another short book that really packs a punch in terms of plot and characterization and and its sort of literary style, you know, its prose, prose style. It, this one set... Um, in small town Argentina rather than small town Chile um, and the whole book, book takes place in the time that it takes for two young men to die having stabbed each other in a fight in a fairground and um, we get I suppose like a series of, of flashbacks um, and conversations with with ghosts or, or visions of their their two fathers um that sort of come to them as they're lying there sort of gradually sort of slipping out of consciousness um we get and and so we get the story of how they come to be there and why they came to kill each other we get you know their family history um the feud between their two fathers their fathers are the the, the brick makers of the title um we get to know their mothers who are really kind of rich strong characters you know the female characters in this book are really interesting although it's predominantly about these these two young men and their fathers um he's it's and we hear how they were friends and then how they kind of almost take on the feuding relationship that their fathers had and then how a a, 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 a gay relationship in in uh, affecting the families um becomes the final the final trigger that that brings about the this 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 mortal fight almada is um a feminist writer i think i think she's exploring the impact of a kind of culture of machismo um in argentina and how that damages um families, it damages women, but it also damages the men um, who uh, have to sort of live up to um, a certain set of sort of um, expectations um, because of that macho kind of culture. Um, it, so that is her purpose, I think, but it's not a preachy book. I mean, you know, she's not lecturing us. You know, this is a story that has where which you feel like these are real people and real situations and it's a very vivid depiction of sort of um, small town kind of working class life um, that rang true for me, I would say. It is a book with lots of violence in it and if that's something that you can't stomach, don't, don't read this book. You know, if you hated, um, uh, if you read Hurricane Season and hated it, you know, don't read, don't read this. But I felt it had real intensity and a kind of poetic beauty, um, notwithstanding the violence that, that, you know, really, yeah, made it a real success for me. 
and it nearly dislodged my um, previous favourite from, from, from the semi-finals, but not quite. I did, in the end, decide to keep as my number one The Anomaly by Hervé Letellier, <coughs> translated from the French by Adriana Hunter. Why? Why? Because The Anomaly is one of those rare books that manages to be both outrageously clever um, at the same time as emotionally engaging. You know, it's it's both playful and serious. Um, the setup is fun because, you know, the, the, the concept, as it were, is that there's a, a plane that passes through a spot of, of turbulence, a storm, and is somehow doubled. And one version of the plane emerges months after the other, but the plane and all the people in it are just as real as the originals that, that, that they are the, the doubles of. And, you know, that immediately sets up uh, uh, this sort of delightful, I don't know, scientific and metaphysical conundrums, doesn't it? You know, it, yeah, which he, he can then unpick and enjoy um, unpicking for us. It also throws up political challenges um, uh, and and psychological dilemmas for particularly for those all those people who who've been doubled and their families and for those that have to decide you know how to how to introduce them and deal with it. I mean you know great great story great story. It the style is quite playful and I like that too. Um, particularly in the first part of the book where we're introduced to all the different characters and, uh, you know, oh, and you won't, if you like, if you can't cope with a book that keeps in introducing new characters and you attach to them and then you go on to another one, you know, it, 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 don't read it if that's a problem for you. It does all come together, but, you know, it, you, have to, you have to give it time, you have to be patient. But each character that's introduced is almost done in a different style or um, uh, as if it was from a different genre. Um, and I really enjoyed that. But it ultimately, it was the fact that the, the, the concept is clever, the style is clever, the, the, the ideas are interesting, but it was the sort of emotional resonance of the book that, that kind of gave it that, took it to that, that other level for me. Um, yeah. So I think it would definitely be one of my, my books of the year and um, it's my number one. But what will the other judges have thought? Well, I shall find out on October the 8th and then put this video up. <laughs>